Attention culture consumers, join me, the queen of queries, Sarah O'Connor, and my band of nerdy knights, Colleen McMillan, Flo Siegel, and Anders Drew, on Bohemian Geek Studies, where we take extremely dorky dives into our favorite fandoms, especially that Star Wars galaxy far, far away. Listen each week as we examine the stories that mean so much to us. Bohemian Geek Studies is available wherever you get your podcasts and is proudly part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Hello there, I'm Colleen. I'm Anders. And I'm Daniel. We're three nerds that met through our love of science fiction and fantasy storytelling. Of course, one of our favorites is George Lucas's signature achievement, Star Wars. And if there's one thing the internet definitely doesn't have enough of, it's nerds talking about Star Wars. So here we are with yet another Star Wars podcast, where each week we discuss one of the films in the current Star Wars canon. From the sands of Tatooine to the levels of Coruscant, we cover it all. Yet another Star Wars podcast is available wherever you get your podcast and is part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Hi, I'm Shamar Griffith. And I'm Andrew Tahada. I am a blurred with a love for artwork and comics and animation. And I'm a freelance writer with a love for pretty much the same things. We grew up together and spent our formative years watching and talking about DC superhero shows and content. In fact, we still do. Every episode, we will discuss a film and its connection to the DC animated movie universe, compare it to its original source material, and share our thoughts on the adaptation. We've enjoyed our conversations these past couple of decades, and we think you will too. This is yet another DC Animated Podcast. Welcome to yet another episode of yet another DC Animated Podcast. My name is Shamar Griffith, codename Comics Chance. And I am Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. Andrew and I have known each other since 1996. That was when production and shooting started for Batman and Robin. Some would say the best Batman. No, no, it's, it's not. It's, <laughs> oh, it's, I was about to say, <laughs> who says that? <laughs> Some contrarian was like, well, actually, Batman and Robin is the best of them all. No. Go home, oh, yeah. hipster. You're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but talking about Batman and Robin, today we are talking about one of the most iconic stories when it comes to the dynamic duo with... Batman, Death in the Family. Now, I know we promised that this would be a live reaction review of the film as we're going through it. However, just like the Facebook outage of 2021, I, funny thing, same day, my computer crapped out. <laughs> Arguably the greatest work we've ever done, but you'll never hear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's all gone. Like Jason rising from the Lazarus pit, we have risen to do this this uh, new version of it where... Yeah, following more of our style, our, our recap style. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's more in line. So, and you know, this time, for those who we will get into all the specifics, but this movie has seven endings. So today, we're not going to go through all of them for you because that would have been the live version where uh, I think Morgan Freeman stopped by. It was great. He was there for the entire time. Yeah. Unfortunately, it, I'll never hear it. Yeah, sorry guys, but uh, in exchange, what we will give you is out of the seven, we'll go into the two best and the two worst endings <laughs> that you can get. Also, we should probably start, why are we talking about multiple endings in the first place? Yes, because this is the first DC film created, first animated DC film in which they adopted the interactive play by which we mean you are able to choose your adventure, much like an R.L. Stein book from our childhood. This is what made it really fun for me. Also, this movie is probably one of the movies that has gotten really bad reviews from users, from, uh, ranging from Amazon, IMDb, IGN, any place you find a review of this film is gotten at least one star. And it's mainly because the digital format of the film does not allow you to make these choices. Yes, let's get this out of the way. We're going to do something we don't usually do. And right away, we're going to give you a rating for the digital version of Death in the Family. It's a <laughs> zero out of 10. Oh, man, this is so bad. <laughs> do, <laughs> do not, under any circumstances, watch Death in the Family if you cannot make any choices. There, there's no reason to watch this movie. 
And it's sad because this movie was highly publicized as you're going to be able to make these choices on the digital format. And it's currently the same format that you see on HBO Max, Amazon, any place you buy this film digitally, you cannot make these choices. And everyone like us had to sit through originally Bruce Greenwood, who is the voice of Batman in our film, telling the story about what happened during the events of Batman Under the Red Hood, the 2010 film that personally is a very much a favorite of mine. So I was very hurt to see that Death in the Family, which is supposed to be a very great companion piece, according to the way it was marketed, didn't do it justice. The main reason is because if you have paid for the digital copy and you do not get to make the choices, we cannot emphasize enough it's a zero out of 10. Yes. If you can see it for free and you're still not making the choices, it's a one out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, to get the full experience, like we did, either get the DVD, the Blu-ray that lets you make the choices or make sure that you are playing it on some medium that makes you choose things. If not, yes. leave don't waste your time. <laughs> so <laughs> right you off just the bat, really like the voice of Bruce Greenwood. I, I don't know. <laughs> sure. And it's a great voice. But right off the bat, we're going to tell you, do not spend money on a non-interactive copy of this at all. But now that that's out of the way, <laughs> <laughs> let us, uh, shall we, shall we get into the movie? Who's, who's in this thing? Because it's not the originals, right? It is. Actually, we have a good majority of the originals here in this film from the original um, Batman Under the Red Hood movie that once again came out in 2010. Back in the directorial seat is Brandon Vietti, who this time around actually writes the movie Death in the Family and all the choices that you get. So if you don't know who Brandon Vietti is, this guy, he knows his Batman. He, as I mentioned, did the Red Hood. He got an Emmy for his work on the underappreciated Batman series from 2004. And he's currently the co-producer on Young Justice. Um, so all of which is available on the HBO Max. So HBO Max, we are looking at you to, you know, maybe open the line of communication with us. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> <laughs> For our cast, we have, as I mentioned, Bruce Greenwood is the voice of Bruce Wayne Batman. And next we have with a resume that's just way too long to even list here on our show here. John DiMaggio is the Joker once again, as he was in Under the Red Hood. And he, his voice is just iconic in this one. I, I love it. Then we have Zara Fazal, who is voicing Talia al Ghul. So we have a new character being introduced in our film here, but definitely keep an eye out for her because she's going to be, at the time of our recording, she will be the voice of Talia al Ghul again in Catwoman Hunted, the next DC animated film in 2022. Finally, we have Gary Cole returning as Commissioner Gordon, and we have rounding out the entire squad of Jason Todd, the star of our film, is now being voiced with his returning actor, Vincent Martella. Yes, it, and it's cool. I, I like the way they did that because he was originally Robin mm -hmm. when they first recorded it, and now he's old enough to be Jason. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I do miss our supernatural man, but I do understand the time and schedule prevented uh probably prevented him from returning but uh the new actor does a great job the new old actor i should yes. say <laughs> that is basically our cast here in this movie where we get a chance to make some choices very much reminiscent of where people in 1988 were able to call in and decide that you know that we can kill robin this time we decided to kind of change up the game here yeah, there's a few few more choices you get, and it all starts from one central prologue. So in the prologue begins with Batman and Jason Todd Robin are out trying to bust down some drug dealers. Mm -hmm. And right about the bat, this is one of the funniest Batman scenes of all time, because after they both dodge bullets together, Jason breaks the collarbone of this drug dealing pimp. Oh, he's also a drug dealing pimp. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't forget the pimp part. <laughs> right. He, he's he's uh, into multiple. He dabbles. He dabbles in multiple fields. <laughs> he of diversifies time. his criminology. Exactly. <laughs> I, you got to love it. Gotta love someone who's like really uh, out there. And Batman is criticizing Jason like, 
hey, man, you broke his collarbone. And I'm like, Batman, come on. You know you have broken bones for less. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't sit here pretending to be all high and mighty. And if you don't believe us in the comic itself, there's like the first couple panels. Batman is talking to himself. Is a great monologue about the different ways he's going to put people in traction. So... Again, Batman takes several seats on this whole high and mighty ground that you're now established for yourself against Jason. (laughs) But in any case, his uh, temporary high and mighty position motivates him to take Jason off of active duty. So while Jason is sitting at home in the Batcave, probably playing uh, Tetris or Injustice, Batman flies to Europe to try to stop Rachel Ghoul from detonating these dirty bombs. And at the same time, Jason is chasing the Joker to stop whatever scheme he's got going on. And Jason and Batman meet in the middle. I think Joker was trying to sell, actually, the dirty bombs Uh, to Michelle Gould. Yeah, that was the connection. So um, they were able to, because of the fact that the crimes were fell into each other's jurisdictions and, I don't know, the law and order of Gotham, they were able to, they just decided to team up there. Joker was making his getaway. Batman was able to stop the bombs from being taken to other places where Ra's al Ghul was stationed. But at the same time, they decided to split up Jason and and Batman. Batman tells Jason to stay put. We'll go after Joker together. We get this picture painted about Jason that he's uh, pretty hard-headed. He doesn't really listen to authority that much. So obviously, just like in the original movie, Jason decides to go on to take down Joker by himself because I guess, again, this is kind of like his mission. Yep. And you know how that goes, crowbar, because Jason gets kidnapped by the Joker. The Joker hits him with the crowbar repeatedly and leaves him in a warehouse that is set to explode. Batman gets on his bike and presses his Nas button from that he borrowed from Dominic Toretto and is racing to get to Jason as quick as possible. And this is where you get the first choice. So you have, a, you have three choices. Batman can save Jason. Jason can miraculously survive. Or... Jason dies as he normally does. Obviously, because we know the story of Jason Todd and his transition from being Robin to Red Hood. So we decided to try out one of these newer choices first. And uh, just to quickly recap, if you do click on Robin Dies, it takes you to the natural story. Bruce Greenwood voicing Batman in the diner, telling his story about what happened and the transitions of all the events. Basically, a a recap of Under the Red Hood. This is the second worst ending you can go after. (laughs) Because this this story, the narration adds some context. And there is some interesting internal monologue you get from Bruce that gets brought up during this monologue where he's just retelling the events of the Red Hood. But just rewatch Red Hood. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's Honestly. no reason for you to watch a half hour version of a really good movie. <laughs> right. Uh, it's just, which is also available on the HBO Max. <laughs> HBO Max, where is our shout out? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you. Just killing Jason off the bat doesn't give you anything new. Mm-mm. Sure, Batman's talking with Superman in a diner this whole time for some reason, not using any secret aliases. He's just straight up saying he's Batman in the middle of a diner. <laughs> so, you, you seem kind of upset about that there, Andrew. I, <laughs> oh, God. My least favorite superhero cliche when they talk in diners about everything. <laughs> Guys, diners, people hear things, all right? Especially in Gotham. I guarantee you two faces in the back. Like, did you just say you were Batman? And that's Superman? <laughs> oh, that's starting to make a lot of sense. All right, I'm going to come back later. See you guys. Yeah, so it, killing Jason doesn't really get you anything. It automatically torpedoes your experience. So if you really want to watch the narration, maybe you have an hour left before you got to get on a plane and you want to rewatch Red Hood, but you don't have the time. In this hilariously <laughs> specific scenario, then pick that. But otherwise, no, no. This is a worse version of a great movie. Yeah. Don't do it. Five yeah. out of 10 ending. Yeah. So we decided to go with the 
first choice being that Jason cheats death. And it was a bit of a, a wild scenario because when it first starts off, Batman, the, the explosion still happens. The Jason gets caught in the middle of it. He's still stuck in the building. Batman is rushing over to find any remnants of any like anything to just see if maybe he's still alive. And he gets picked up and Jason is just burnt. Like he's got the kind of like iconic two-faced kind of style to him. I think that's something that's definitely adopted a lot in this film. And at that moment, he starts coughing. And there's just a moment of just pride and glee on Batman's face. And he's just yelling out to the to the sky. He's alive. Thank God my son is alive, which is really something that I never really expected to hear Batman to really kind of like drive home a lot into this film. This at least this section is just like the the fact that Jason Todd is his son, like he's adopting that mindset to him. Yes. And while Batman is very happy with these outcome, Jason is a little less so. Mm -hmm. And we cut to him in bandages surrounded by the bat family who is just ecstatic to see him and we get this inner monologue of this festering rage inside of jason for he thinks all of them pity him all of them are looking down at him he can't bear to live with this but he blames batman for mm -hmm. tossing him in this life and he's right but <laughs> he all the resentment is boiling and boiling and to eventually to the point where he decides no more and fully clothed in bandages he runs out into the yard and escapes wayne manor and leaves the bat family behind yeah another great thing about this film was that instead of doing what we thought they were going to do and kind of like just animating it out full on through there's a lot of almost like stop motion kind of style to this. You're seeing images and you're just hearing whoever it is that's speaking tell their story. So unlike the first choice where Robin dies when it's just like you're basically just getting a spark noted version of Under the Red Hood, there's some new illustrations that pop up here. A lot of the characters actually don't even have speaking roles that pop up. Like we see Barbara Gordon, Alfred, a lot of them, they don't speak. I think that was something that I thought was pretty cool. It was a great way to, you know, not have to crazily try to create all these scenes for us because a lot of it can be told in this strong imagery. Like there's like flashing scenes between how Jason sees the world and how basically the, everybody else in the Bat family sees the world. Once um, Jason kind of decides that he's done with the Bat family, he dons a costume that is very reminiscent of Hush. So... I was really shocked to see that they decided to go this route because it connects so much to our comic from our movie Batman Hush in which Jason is seen as somebody who possibly could have been Hush. So now to actually see it played out in this new story was really cool to me. Yeah, and we've already covered Hush here. and We <laughs> have expressed our our opinions about uh, the reveal of who Hush was. So this Hush makes a lot more sense. This is a Hush who knows Batman, who has had intimate knowledge. And he, the bandages even make sense to his aesthetic. It makes perfect sense. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes. So he adopts the aesthetic of Hush and he decides to bring some vigilante justice to Gotham. And here is where things get too familiar because Jason decides to basically do what he did in Red Hood just with a different costume and goes on this long reign of terror just attacking people in Gotham and trying to kill the criminal element as much as possible under this new guise and Batman can't catch him fast enough he's now an enemy of the Bat family and things are just spiraling out of control for him until <laughs> one night <laughs> where he's hanging out and all of a sudden he's like, I, I know someone's behind me and I have an explosive at my, behind me just in case somebody tries to sneak up on me. And you hear the voice of Talia Al Ghul go, you don't think I don't know that already, basically? And she throws 
the disabled detonator at his feet. And Jason turns around and there Talia is. Yes. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar about who Talia is, then you need to stop right here and head over to listen to our Son of Batman episodes. Uh, so Talia reveals that she would want for Jason to kind of basically be a part of the league. And in doing so, he will be taking care of the child that she and Bruce have together. There is a little baby Damien, you know, less murderous eyes that he has this time around. As Jason is looking at this kid, he's just, he's just like, I'm sorry, you want me to take care of your kid as a way to get into the League of Assassins? And at this moment, Jason's having his own internal monologue. And he's just like, you know what? I'm, I'll do it. I'll take care of this kid. But what I'll do is that I'll raise him to have hatred towards his father and then have hatred towards his mother, therefore effectively bringing down and ending the crime that comes from the League of Assassins while also tearing down the Wayne Empire that Batman has been creating. And then it's a, a hard stop right there. A hard stop on this story. It just straight up ends. Yeah. Which I was baffled by because we had, this is when things are starting to get interesting where mm. I, up to this point, had been fairly Red Hood, except with added burns. And then you introduce a character that was not in the original. Well, two, Damien and Talia. Talia right. is disabling bombs while she has a baby in her hand. I'm interested. Swag. That's just amazing. Yeah, just like, <laughs> how do you do it with two yeah. hands? But they, they just cut it right here. They just, they, it's over. There's nothing else. There's nothing else to this, this story. What, what would you give it out of 10, this, this ending? I liked it because I felt like it has so much potential. So I would give it an eight because... I felt like it was a very nice flow. It started with the basically kind of being like under the red hood, but tying in the, the connections with Hush and then tying in the connections of just kind of like Jason knows that Talia was pregnant, but they were under the assumption that she had lost the baby, tying it back once again to the um, birth of the demon comic, I believe from the, um, from the recommended reading in the Son of Batman film. So the comic book knowledge was swarming, was just like, and it was probably my second favorite ending, even though it kind of ended really abruptly. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I went the other way on this one. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh this is my least favorite ending by Ooh. far. I uh, similarly to how I felt about the narration, you know, twenty minutes of narration giving us the same story. I feel like if you're going to set up a whole Red Hood, Red Hood basically adopts Damien. Mm -hmm. You got to go further. You, you can't <laughs> leave it there. You, you just can't. You can't leave me there. And just all the questions I have about Talia handing over her whole child to someone she does not know. I mean, how is he going to feed this kid? Where is the money coming from? I had so many questions. I, I had too many questions, in fact. This is my this is my least favorite ending. I very opposite end, four out of ten. At least the original. I'm like, okay, it had some uh, poetic dialogue <laughs> and the story made sense. Here, I uh, I have way too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to accept it, man. Sometimes the the daughter of the criminal like lord is just gonna come over and just drop off a kid for you to take care of. That just it happens. You know, I just hope that doesn't happen to me. I gotta say. <laughs> Now that we played through that one, there was no other choices you can make into that. So we're going to go back to where we can make the choices again. And that is back where we can choose whether or not Jason dies or not. And as you mentioned, there were three choices, either Jason cheats death, Jason dies, or the last one, Batman is able to save Jason Todd. And I got to say, this was probably the start of my some of my actually real favorite and least favorite choices. And this because this one was just wild from the very beginning. Yes. After Batman saves Jason, 
you pick that option. You see him shield, get to Jason just in time. There's a little extra time on the timer this time around. And shields Jason from the blast. Now Batman ends up burnt. But unlike Jason, he does not survive this burn. And you have this very, very touching extended monologue where Batman tells Jason, look, this is it for me. I'm not going to make it. There's no way I'm going to survive this. So I need you to promise that you won't kill the Joker. Specifically, he's like, do not kill the Joker for what Mm -hmm. he did to me. Please don't go down that road. Do not let this turn you into a killer. It's a great monologue. And right then and there, they give you the choice. They ask you, does Jason keep Bruce's promise? Or do you want him to become a killer? They make you choose right then and there. And it's a great choice, especially after hearing the monologue and the lead-in. Already going into this, I was like, these are going to be my favorite choices because that is just a stirring monologue. It's a great setup. And I, I was ready. I also got to say, you don't get much time to make these choices. So these are very quick choices. These are what felt like maybe 10 to 15 seconds where Mm -hmm. you have to make these choices. So we decided to go first time around a more passive route, decided that we were going to catch the Joker, you know, justice, not vengeance. Damian Wayne has taught us well. And as we're watching this story, we just get more of monologues from Jason here, who Vincent Martella, I got to say, he's really nailing the voice, given the fact that compared to the original film, where it was five years later, it is now basically just a couple days to a month following these events. And during this time, Jason, he is adopting more of the mindset of Batman. He's burying himself into his work, basically, of trying to find the Joker while also taking down crime as he's doing this work and just telling us, like he's trying to tell us that he's okay. He's doing what he needs to do. He's going to keep fighting the good fight. We hear this random voice, this kind of voice of God kind of echoing out things saying kill. And, and when Jason decides to adopt the style of the red hood in an effort to bring Joker out and get him to chase after him, because as a reminder, Before Joker became the Joker, we never really knew his real name, but he did end up adopting this character of the Red Hood, who was forced into committing a crime before falling into a vat and then becoming the Joker. So because Jason is now acting as the Red Hood, uh, you see kind of the same scenes as we saw in the original film. And now we finally catch up to the Joker, who is on top of a truck. Oh, what important (laughs) distinction there. Yes. So you see all the scenes from the original of him in action as the Red Hood, but no one dies. He doesn't kill anybody. One of the best moments is uh, there's an iconic scene from the original where he shoots a rocket launcher at Black Mask Mm -hmm. and Black Mask escapes the rocket launcher just in time. The door nearly takes off his head, but he survives. In this version, when he shoots the rocket launcher at Black Mask, it opens up a little flag that says bang, just scaring, scaring Black Mask and he walks away. So it, it's you see that he's really taking it to heart. This is not the Jason, the killer Red Hood that we know and love. It's a different reformed Red Hood. Mm-hmm. And he shows up in the Red Hood garb to confront Joker on the bridge, where again, Joker's trying to light a bunch of gangsters on fire that the Red Hood has coerced into working for him. And this is where this, this scene, I, I nearly jumped out of my seat when I saw this. But while Joker is standing on top of a truck, the Red Hood disappears from his perch and uses a crowbar to trip the <laughs> Joker up. This was incredible. I lost my mind. This was amazing to see Jason turn the crowbar against the Joker. I I was floored to see this and I I was so happy. I was so happy to see this. Oh yeah. And he proceeds to fight with the crowbar while also using Batman's tactics of the smoke screen. There's at one point where Jason hits him so hard in the face that Joker basically does a 
720 or 1080. I don't, I don't know how many more times you could spin this. Basically, if you could pull it off in Tony Hawk Pro Skater, that's how many times that Joker spun around. <laughs> and at this moment, Red Hood has Joker dead to rights. So we're wondering now, are we going to pull the trigger here? You know, we we definitely had chosen the let's cast Joker. So this is it's, this is really a shocking moment for both of us here as we're just watching this. And as they're talking, Joker mentions that, like, you know, it's crazy how you went on this, like, really great killing streak just to get my attention. And Jason's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I never killed anybody. And then Joker explains throughout the entire time that Jason has been taking out villains or at least like shooting at them he really truly has been killing them so it's here that we're realizing that even that voice that was telling jason to kill that we were hearing but we're really ignoring this entire time has been repressing all of jason's memories about what he's been doing and that is basically not following what batman told him to do of not to kill this was incredible <laughs> so good. It so, is an incredible twist. I was floored. I we were, I mean we both were floored. I mean, this was just crazy that the whole time he was racking up a body count and he had deluded himself into thinking by focusing on life and preservation of life, that was enough. But you get this thing where it was like that wasn't enough. He had insisted he was fine. And because he did that, he never got to heal, which is, I mean, it's a great lesson. And he had developed this split personality. And I would just floored. I would have never expected in a million years for the, this twist to happen. And after Jason absorbs this, again, you get a split second choice. Now that you've done so much, do, what do you do? Do you still try to keep the Joker alive? Do you, still, do you kill him? And we chose life because we said, you know what? He's killed a lot of people. Maybe this is the one he can save. Yes. And at that moment, Jason takes the gun, aims it at Joker's head, and pistol whips him right down the middle, knocking him out. As this gives Jason some time to get away, Commissioner Gordon runs up and doesn't catch Red Hood. He just sees Joker on the ground. We now cut to a scene. Jason is on top of Wayne Industries Tower. He hears a voice and it's not intelligible language. It's someone saying Zer and R. He turns around and he sees that Batman, or at least someone dressed like him, is walking towards him and is just only really saying Zer and R this entire time. And then we get another reveal. I, I'm kind of glad that we kind of got this reveal because it really ties in a lot to just a really great Batman story as well. Because guess what? Talia put her foot in it again and <laughs> decided to resurrect Batman. And now Batman is basically only capable of saying a short phrase. And... Like the other ending, she wants to recruit Jason for the League of Assassins. And because he is still trying to grapple with the reality of what he's done, he's like, nah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for it. Are you crazy? And she's like, well, I'm not really taking no for an answer. So Batman, go kill this fool. Again, you got a split second choice. You got to choose whether mm -hmm. to kill Batman or try to save him. And we chose to save him. You know, we're, we're optimists. We're like, maybe. Right. So in this fight, if you choose to, to try to, to fight and save, you will come up across. Red Hood will get stabbed in the hand. And he'll have a trick hand on his other hand. The same thing that Joker used on him. And Red Hood will tase Batman. At the same time, he'll use his hood as an explosive device to knock out Talia. And best part... Dick Grayson in the Batman suit shows up to inspect what happened and sees Batman. He sees Red Hood knocked out. And at this point, Dick takes Batman and Red Hood back to the Batcave and tries to reconcile the damaged relationship. 
Yeah, so this pulls a lot from a lot of the great comics. We get a scene here from kind of like the Batman R.I.P. story arc because of the fact of the Zer and R. Uh, this is at one point, Bat- the story of Batman does kind of like, before this, before Batman R.I.P., the story of Batman is just basically told throughout the cosmos. So back in um, Batman number 113 in February of 1958, there was actually a Batman of Zer and R, which is this alien world. And the alien there, he adopts the personality and style of Batman in order to save his alien race. So he and Bruce Wayne actually do cross paths. Batman doesn't even know if it's real or not. If you do kind of want to see it play out a little bit, it's called the Batman Batman Superman of um, Planet X. It was also done in the Batman Brave and the Bold television series as well. But this one is more pulling from the kind of like the modern age Grant Morrison change that happened to this. During this time, Batman decides to take part in a psychological experiment. I don't know why he would do that, given the fact that we already know. Come on. (laughs) Do you know the psychologist in in Gotham City? Has one, has a single psychologist in Gotham City fixed anything? (laughs) Come on, Bruce. Come on. Or it didn't even have like an ulterior motive, at least. Exactly. Even Lee. (laughs) Even Lee. Come on. You're not exempt. So during this time, one of the psychologists decided to hypnotically put a trigger into the mind of Batman, uh, connected to the phrase Zer and R. And much like pulling from what this had in this scene here, Batman gathers this phrase from the last words that his father has ever told him which was after they went to go see Zorro, uh, they were leaving. And at that moment, Bruce is just like, wouldn't it be awesome if Zorro came through on Gotham on his horse? And his father tells him that if Zorro was real, Zorro, they would quickly put Zorro in Arkham. And this is because these are like the last words his father says to him. It's just him saying Zorro and R or really broken down Zorro and Arkham. And this plays out in this final scene which at first I will say when I first watched it, I was just like, I didn't really know if they were trying to connect it to this. I thought they were trying to connect it to the um, alien Batman, but this one was much better because in this phrase that's get told, that gets said to him, this is when Batman becomes a bit more psychotic and homicidal, which we saw in the personality trait of the Batman who was facing off against Jason Todd here on the roof. So they get some narration from Jason He's hung up super heroics at the moment. And Batman is there just repeating those last words over and over again. And this is where this branch ends. What do you think? What do you think of this, this branch of Ooh, death in the family? This is, I'm not even going to play around for it. This was a 10 out of 10 for me. I love this. Hell yeah. progression. <laughs> this was so good. Like I would watch this a hundred. If this was, a, it felt so much like I was reading the comic. It felt so much like, the, the amount of just emotion I would have gotten from watching Under the Red Hood again, everything about it just seemed great. I think it was also a great ending, too, to show that the legacy of Batman is still continuing and it doesn't have to be contingent on Bruce Wayne. Dick Grayson pulls up the, the cow just like he does in Battle for the Cow. Like everything about this was just so good. It was a natural progression of all the stages. I mean, we didn't have any like secret Damian Wayne babies popping up or anything like that. It was, and also just the fact that we find out that Jason has been repressing all the moments in which he's killed somebody. It, it was just the cherry on top of this wonderful Sunday that Brian, Brandon Vietti has just produced for this film. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna say this is this is a top tier ending. This is this is what we came here to do. Yeah. These are the kind of choices we wanted to see. And it's just so satisfying to have the end of the story be Jason and Batman have both lost themselves. You know, this last mission they went on together, they lost everything in this yeah. mission. And this is the the epitome of what it is, where you both see them struggling to hold on to their mental health but they're still going to try and pull through it's a satisfying ending i love seeing damien uh sorry <laughs> damien still <laughs> on the brain i love seeing dick underneath the cowl as batman it's a great take on the story and although i bet you're wondering what happens if you try to kill batman or kill joker well you're gonna have to find out for yourself because we're done with this branch 
we got to go to the other branch now where we all go all way back to Batman has just died. Jason is holding Batman and he says, should I kill or should I save the Joker? And this time we chose kill. Yeah, this one was wild because it starts off with Jason once again in the Batcave. Everybody's talking with him. We get some really great cameos, non-speaking roles. It, you don't even see their faces. It's much like at the end of Shazam. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's much like in the end of Shazam where you're just seeing the heroes uh, coming up to Jason to try to console him in ways but jason is just unbothered by their presence like superman is there and which was really weird because it's like he's standing heroically and <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah it's like why are you like you can even put an arm over the dude or nothing can even hand on the shoulder i don't know but yeah he's visited by superman wonder woman flash um nightwing stops by to talk with him a couple of times uh favorite shot of mine was the fact that nightwing drinks boba tea that is now canon in the dc universe <laughs> i'm acknowledging that right now i also loved how every time he got visited the bandages he'd have less bandages on his face yes so there was like a little subtle progression of time and like outward physical healing but emotionally it was still he was still trying to go through things and at the end of the sequence, he says, you know what? Tr sharing my pain and my, my trauma kind of helped me move on to a point. So he decides to go out to a diner and just try to take everything in because right now Dick is out as Batman. And while he's at the diner, someone's like, <laughs> that's not really Batman, which, of course, prompts Jason to be like, uh, excuse me, sir, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah and they get into a really kind of great conversation here it's just like you know um you know it's you can tell he's like you can tell by the the way of his style and whatnot i've i've seen batman fight and just questioning more it was like how's this person seen batman fight we're thinking is it harvey dent because of you know we we're, were told that he's supposed to be in this movie or is it like commissioner gordon and as he turns around we see a normal version of the person who is basically joker we are now wondering it's like has the joker reformed like he he's saying things like he has been writing in his journal to calm his thoughts a bit and you know like really just getting the help that he needs so you know thank you joker for what for being an advocate for for therapy <laughs> and as he's talking he's telling these stories about much like how the rest of the heroes were doing so and just sharing stories of their time with batman joker decides to share his own story in which he tells him about how he once told batman a joke and it's a joke about these two guys who are escaping from a mental institution they are getting to the right to the point where it's just like it's the final stage for them and as he's hearing this joke jason's just like crap i've heard this before and we get flashes of Jason at the back computer and he's like reading the same exact dialogue that we're hearing because this joke is the killing joke, which is, again, another iconic Batman story, which we just covered in our previous episode. So if you haven't watched it yet or haven't listened to the episode yet, you need to stop now, go back there and then come back here. Because as he's sharing this, you just see scenes and scenes of what happened during that those events. We now see that Jason is just flashing through all the moments of that led up into the death of Batman. And now Jason has to make one final choice here. Fortunately, we don't have to make that choice for him because Jason just automatically does what we already had chosen to do. And he takes a knife from the table at the diner and straight up stabs Joker straight right through the eye. Yeah. And Joker, who realized it was Jason after Jason repeated a phrase from the torture, Joker goes to reach for his eye and in doing so, peels off some of his paint. And you can see the white makeup underneath. He's thrilled, of course. He's thrilled yeah. <laughs> that Jason was pushed over the edge and killed. Right away, GCPD, I guess they were <laughs> around the corner, shows up. And you're given the choice of whether to try to just turn yourself in or, you know, run away from the cops. Right. And guess what? You know what? 
let, let's let's go a little renegade. We decided let's get away from the cops. And Jason takes down the two officers <laughs> effortlessly. I mean, <laughs> it is nothing to him. And in a really interesting turn, you see that he goes on to become the Red Robin. He adopts this, it, the moniker is kind of given to him because he's covering streets in blood while wearing a Robin-esque costume. And you get some of those repeated scenes from when he was Hush, but this time we know it's Dick underneath the bat suit. Yes. Instead of a set of Bruce, which is so, so fun. And it all culminates to Red Robin doing his thing, trying to shoot up criminals. And he comes across another familiar face, or should I say familiar faces? <laughs> oh, nice one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this villain here, Jason's story in general, he has a very strong connection to Two-Face. Two-Face in the comics is responsible for the death of Jason's parents, or at least his mother, I mean, sorry, or at least his father, because his father was a criminal that joined on Two-Face's gang. And during the events of a failed crime, Two-Face decides to shoot and kill his father. Jason finds this out much later, which was one of the main reasons why there's a much more of a divide between Jason and Bruce, because Bruce had found out, obviously hid it from Jason. So now Jason decides to face off against Two-Face. And the reason why I had to bring up that part about Two-Face and the involvement of his father is because at one point, as the two of them are fighting and Two-Face has Jason pinned, he's telling him like, why is it that you're coming after me? Did I do something to you? Do I have some kind of like weird connection to like a friend, uh, a cousin, a, a mom, a dad? And at this moment, Jason kind of goes off. Like he's like, he's ready to fight. He can't, he's pinned. And at that moment, it's clear that Two-Face now knows that he's in this way connected to Red Robin because of the father connection. So we now get to the point where it's our second choice. Two-Face has his gun pointed at Red Robin as Red Robin is pinned under a fallen sculpture. Two-Face flips his coin. We get our next choice here. And this one, which I was really surprised to see, we don't know what's going to happen, whichever choice we make. We only see the image of Two-Face's coin, the regular side, and the one that scratched up. So which side did we go with first? <laughs> to make it even fun for you, we're not even going to tell you which coin yielded what. But we'll go with the ending that went in a direction we didn't expect. This is the last yeah, yeah. ending we're going to reveal to you guys. And then we'll let you play the rest of it. But there is one coin flip where Two-Face goes, you know what? We're going to get rid of you. We're done. We're done with you, all right? We're, this is it. This is your last day on Earth. And just as he's about to shoot, he gets tased from behind by this little kid. And this little kid is looking at down at Red Robin. It's like, man, Robin, you used to be so, so good, so inspiring to all of us. And now you're just, you're just spreading this, this reign of death and destruction. You know, you, you just became so violent. What happened to you, man? Like, you don't have to kill anybody anymore. You don't have to do this. And Red Robin is just, kind of thrown back by this kid and everyone the crowd there's a crowd building that looks at red robin and it's like who are you man who what is it what is this person you've become and it kind of causes red robin to reflect and he goes man kid you, you drop us some real knowledge what's your name <laughs> And if you probably didn't already figure it out by the fact that jason todd had adopted the red robin suit the kid that he's talking to is the one and only Tim Drake, the one in the natural timeline or Earth One's timeline would later become the third Robin, Jason's successor, and eventually also adopted the moniker of Red Robin. This time around, because Jason is happy to hear what Tim Drake has said to him, it reminds him very much of Bruce's last words to him, that he decides to continue on Bruce's legacy here and not only continues on as Red Robin, but more of the vigilante, the one that doesn't kill, kind of adopting the, uh, the season two approach of Arrow here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he also 
takes Red Robin in to help him along with his fight against crime, turning him into the one and only Bat Kid. Yeah, yeah, uh, there's a there's a Bat Kid at this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, so it's Red Robin and Bat Kid out on the streets of Gotham, not killing people no more. Yeah. Um, what do you give this this particular ending the the bat kid ending <laughs> i would give this a seven a seven out of ten i think again it's just like the one with damian wayne it it just reminds me so much of that it's just like you go on this natural progression of just jason todd becoming this killer and then i don't know like i mean in the first one damian wayne J- jason decides to keep on killing but in this one it's just kind of a nice transition to to have it be that you know, like he's continuing on the legacy in this way. I will say it is a bit weird though, because it's just like pick up Tim Drake along the way and just like give him a suit. Like I feel like there's copyright infringement happening here. Like I, at this point, Dick Grayson owns this suit. So unless he's talking <laughs> with Dick, then it seems weird. But I did like the fact that Red Robin became the the kind of like killer that he was and then turned into this it was it seemed very much like his red hood approach yeah i i would agree with that that assessment i yeah i think for me the seven out of ten was more for the specific speech tim drake gives to (laughs) to, Mm, yes robin that kind of perfectly echoes everything batman was telling him it was just too on the nose i wish they had (laughs) Yeah, I know Tim Drake is smart. I know he's traditionally mm-hmm. very smart, but I would have liked a different version of that speech to just had same thematic things so that it wasn't so obvious that they copy pasted Batman's. It's like, can you copy my work? All right, I'll copy your work, but just change it up a little bit, okay? Yeah. It, it had that kind of feel to it. So if the, the Tim Drake dialogue would have been written a little bit um, not so on the nose and the Bat Kid... I don't know about that at all, but I like the idea of Red Robin reforming and looking at him, looking internally and going, you know what? Maybe, maybe I do need to change. Maybe now's the time I can come back from the brink. I do like that yeah. idea of it. it. It's just like the moral of the story here is if you do a choose your own adventure, please don't throw random boys at the end <laughs> <laughs> that are just going to be used for character development. Just don't do it. <laughs> uh, so we started out at a we started out at a zero out of ten for the the non interactive version of Death of the Family. Yeah. Now that we're here, how many Bat Kids out of ten would you give the fully interactive version of Death of the Family with the few endings we left out because we want you to have some fun too? Mm-hmm. What would you give it? Seven point five. Mm-hmm. I I had more fun than I thought I was going to have while going through these choices. They did a really great job in tying in a lot of great Batman mythos. A lot of these comics that we've been talking about basically have been put into this here in their own way, shape, and form. It was really like experiencing an Elseworld comic from DC in real time while watching it animate, it was so great to just see all these subtle nods and Easter eggs just keep popping up. So I would give it a 7.5 out of 10 because I think not only did they do a great job in just like really nailing it on the head for a person that um that enjoys Batman, but the voice acting was great. I think, you know, to have John DiMaggio, like there's that one, this, his speech about how Jason is breaking down probably now one of my favorite joker speeches of all time Mm -hmm. the only thing that i wish they did a little differently were some of the endings of some of the stories and especially the part of that fact if we just continue on with the natural progression of if jason todd actually dies to rehash it as a shortened version of under the red hood was a waste of time i think you could have done a much better you would have there would have been it would have been much better to just kind of just do it as they maybe like a maybe like a double release like have it be that you can buy under the red hood or watch under the red hood and then take part in this journey which is another thing too another reason for my lower rating andrew i've learned from you over the period (laughs) of our our podcast you if you're 
have a movie that you need to watch another movie in order to understand it is not you do not get a 10 you exactly but you still can get a high number or a relatively middle ground number as i'm giving it now with my 7.5 exactly it's like you can go in and watch the dark knight right now you never saw batman begins it makes perfect sense yes you can't do that for dark knight rises you know <laughs> <laughs> or or infinity war or endgame you yes. know it, it doesn't make any sense so you know just a little little uh, little tip for you guys. Yeah, I I would say seven bad kids out of ten is a, is about right because if you like Under the Red Hood as much as we do, this is going to be a fun experience for you. It's a great just having fun going through the choices for a while. But what holds this back is you know <laughs> not all the choices are created equal, and. Which is to be expected in the choose your own adventure. You're going to have some duds, but what there's such a contrast between the duds of this movie and yeah. the high points that you wonder what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, the the rehash we we've gone off about it several times, but just to do a 30 minute rehash of Under the Red Hood just doesn't make any sense. And now another aspect I really like about this is that the feeling that Jason Todd is always destined to become a killer. Yes. I love that that theme that he's destined to cross the line. He's the one in the Bat family that will always cross that line unintentionally or intentionally. But what he does after defines who he is. Mm-hmm. I love I love that idea and I think that idea shown through even the worst of endings. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I think that aspect of it is great voice acting john dimaggio agree with you on that joker monologue it's a fantastic joker monologue that he gets he i mean he gets several but the Mm -hmm. one on the bridge is a particular highlight so go watch the red hood (laughs) if you haven't seen batman under the red hood don't don't even look at this until you have and then get the interactive version Mm -hmm. and have some fun with it and if you have seen red hood a while back and you can just jump into this one and it might be fun to just do it. But yeah, just uh, or see Red Hood, skip the obvious ending and then play the rest of them. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can customize this evening. But yeah, there is absolutely no reason. <laughs> no, don't do any non-interactive version. Play interactive. Make your own choices. Yes. You know, be as be as free to choose as, you know, your average freelancer, you know, choose and work as as they go. And speaking of freelancers, here's a little bit more from our affiliate partner here, Fiverr. Do you need a freelancer to help you with your website or WordPress site? Or an expert presentation designer to help with that big work project? Or maybe you just need someone to write expert articles and blogs for that website. Look no further than the number one freelance marketplace, Fiverr. You can find designers, programmers, and more for seconds, some for as low as $5 per gig. Fiverr is the ideal tool to help you with your pressing projects. Just post your gig or search for freelancers and you're off to the races. Don't deal with the hassle of finding freelancers yourself. Let Fiverr help you. See the link in the description of this episode to get started. Please note that yet another DC animated podcast is an affiliate partner of Fiverr. We may receive commissions on purchases and services you buy after you click the link below. These commissions help support the growth of yet another DC animated podcast. So we appreciate your continued support. All right, so that was a word from our superpower freelancers over at Fiverr. Now it's time for that comic book knowledge where we're going to be talking about everything dealing with Jason Todd, one of the most iconic characters within the DC Batman family. Uh, He first popped up on the screen, or actually in the comic book pages, sorry, Uh, (laughs) back in 1983 in Batman number 357. He kind of had much, once again, comic books. They changed up the mythos so often. He originally started out very similar to Dick Grayson, in which he was a kid of like circus parents who, very similar backstory, were killed. Batman was able to bring him in. And then that was more of our Silver Age Jason Todd. Once the events of Crisis happened, they decided to change his character. Most importantly, instead of giving him red hair like he originally had, they decided to give him black hair because back in the Silver Age, he used to dye his hair black to look more like Robin. Oh, okay. (laughs) Interesting. Interesting take. (laughs) 
So during this time, we got more of the Jason Todd that we knew, how their interaction about how they met. Jason Todd is famously known for stealing the wheels off the Batmobile. So Jason Todd, as I mentioned, he started operating as Robin, the second Robin, after the fallout between Dick Grayson and Bruce Wayne that led into their, the split of Batman and Robin. Bruce Wayne felt like he always needed a Robin in order to calm himself down from having those kind of dark thoughts, someone that can, a partner that can help him see the lighter side of things. So once he was feeling those emotions again, he decided when, upon finding Jason Todd stealing the wheels off the Batmobile to bring him, bring him in and adopt him. He ended up just really adopting the Robin persona and the two of them were great together. Unfortunately, Jason Todd had a lot of unresolved familial issues. He definitely needed therapy in this one. I mean, he lost both of his parents very suddenly. So when Batman started to notice that Jason was getting angrier and angrier and taking more risk and just fighting, he decided to bench Robin, just like we saw in the film and death in the family. Jason overheard this decided to leave he went over in the comics he went over to his old home and that's where he was given a box with all his familial possessions because um somebody there looking out for the house decided to save the stuff before the landlord could give this all up so this really started out the events of death in the family that took place in batman number 426 through 429 he finds out in this box that there's a birth certificate of his. And on the birth certificate, it does list his father. However, his mother's name is different. He doesn't know who his mother is now. He, find, he realizes that the woman that raised him for those first couple of years was actually his stepmother. Ah, uh, classic. Yeah. <laughs> and the only indicator that he has about who this new other person is, is the letter S on the birth certificate, because unfortunately, due to some water damage on the box, it smudged the rest of the lettering. So Jason is also able to find a black book that his father owned in the box as well. And he's able to find three women whose names start with the letter S and decides to go on this journey here to find his mother by traveling around the world, stealing Batman's bat card. And so, and then just basically trying to find his mother. Batman is also now at this point trying to take down the Joker. These are following the events of the killing joke. Joker has been put up in Arkham for what he did to Commissioner Gordon's daughter, Barbara Gordon, in which he shot her into the spine. Uh, but once again, Arkham security is not the best because Joker has escaped. <laughs> They're trying to find him. Joker decides that in order to get some funding for his next stage of crime, he's going to sell the one thing that the police was not able to find of his. Joker owned a ground-to-air missile launcher truck that he stole from the United States government. Sure. I mean, all right. All right. <laughs> Joker decides to teach himself how to take apart the truck that basically has some kind of like dirty bombs in them. And he learns how to take it apart and put it back together so that he could travel to Israel and Iran, basically more or less the areas in the Middle East so that he could find a buyer for this truck so that he gets some more money. Batman realizes that this is the Joker's plan. And this leads Batman into a international adventure where he's trying to stop Joker. But at the same time, Jason finds out that the person that could possibly be his mother is also residing in the same area. So the two of them end up crossing paths. He decides to team up with Jason to find his mother while also they also work together to take down Joker because they're realizing now that all three women that are connected to Jason's basically biology are also connected to the Joker in some way. <laughs> of course, of course, <laughs> in a comfortable circle. So after striking out several times with many women that they encounter during this whole journey, it leads to one last woman, Dr. Sheila Haywood, who is a humanitarian. She's, uh, she's doing relief work in Ethiopia and once again crosses paths with Joker. So it's according to her history, she 
she did some dirty work back in as a doctor in Gotham that led her into getting in trouble, losing her license. And now she had moved to Ethiopia in order to make a new life for herself where she was doing relief work and trying to help people there. Joker knows of this because they had crossed paths back in the day and tells her that if you don't help me, I'm going to reveal your secret, therefore getting you fired. So she reluctantly decides to help. Right afterwards, uh, plain clothes, Bruce and Jason meet up with her. And as they're talking, all Bruce has to say is Jason's name, just Jason Todd. And at that moment, she's like, wait, I know this name. Holy crap, this is my kid. And they have a moment in which they hug each other and they're sharing their stories about how they came to be here, obviously without Jason revealing that he's Robin at that point. Bruce decides to give them some time. He decides that he's going to try to see if he can find some more leads on Joker. But as they're talking afterwards, she, Dr. Haywood tells him that she has another meeting that she needs to head to. And unfortunately, she can't, she can't get away from it. And in that moment, Jason sees the person that she's meeting with and sees that it is Joker, even though he's like wearing these, this makeup, which is pulled, which is, I guess, adapted here into our movie. It makes him look like a normal person. He's like painted his skin the same way. Gotcha. Well, I guess, you know, he's owned some stock in a cosmetics company in addition to his old miss- missile deal. <laughs> so... The deal that ends up happening was Dr. Haywood would help Joker steal some medication so he could sell that on the black market. And unlike most people who would just take the medication and just leave nothing behind, Joker says, you know what, for an added twist, I'm going to replace the boxes so with um, my own Joker toxin so that as soon as somebody opens it up, they're infected, immediately killing them. Because once again, here's the crime. Jason decides to stop this from happening. He goes, he finds Bruce. The two of them team up. Batman decides to follow along the truck that has all the medication and also the Joker venom to take it out, stop it from being distributed to the masses and tells Jason, just like in our film, don't go after Joker. Once again, Jason decides to go after him. He sees that his mother now is in the warehouse where it was. And as the two of them are talking, she hits him in the back of the head. And that's when, as he's waking back up, she tells him that she can't afford for him to know the truth about everything that's happening. And this is right after too, that Jason's like, I can help you and reveals to her that she's Robin. Mm. So the two of them are talking and she tells him that she's been embezzling money from the relief aid this entire time. So not only does Joker have this much of a hold over her for her past, if Batman and Robin succeed, this will open up an investigation, which will then open up the fact that she's been embezzling money this entire time. Come on, mom, get it together. (laughs) And at that moment too, Joker is there with his goons. He proceeds to beat Jason with the crowbar and as Jason is left lifeless, pretty much, Joker decides to make sure that there's no evidence. So he sets up the bombs, grabs Dr. Haywood, and ties her to one of the poles that's in the building as well, one of the low bearing poles. As Joker escapes with his crew, Jason wakes up. He is unable to make it over to the bomb, which his mom is telling him to, to just like deactivate it because you know you're Robin, you should know how to do this. So in a moment of just like trying to do any everything possible, Jason starts to untie his mom and tells him, tells her that like, we need to, I, as long as you get out of here, that's the most important thing. I just want you to be safe. His mom heads on over to the door, just like in the movie, the door has been locked by Joker. And in the final seconds, the bomb goes off as Batman is running over to the building. The first person he finds is Jason's mom who reveals to him that Joker is responsible for everything that happened here, reveals that what she's also been involved with. And in that moment, she dies in Batman's arms. Even shares with him too, that how heroic and glad that she was that her son was. Now, Bruce is just running over to find Jason's body. And that's when he picks up the lifeless body of Jason Todd. And yeah, I get, yeah, that makes sense. Well, yeah, now it definitely connects some dots on how they got there. 
as we've seen in many realities, yeah. <laughs> we know what happens to Jason next. Yeah, but the funny thing is that no one has done an adaptation of what happened to the Joker. We always get told that Batman beat the ever-living crap out of the Joker after the events of Death in the Family. That is, that differs greatly from what happened in the comic by which joker gets apprehended by the iranian government he meets up with the um, person who's leading iran and this person makes him a u.n ambassador therefore even though batman has the proof that joker is responsible for the death of jason todd that he was operating in these countries trying to sell um, dirty bombs, trying to stealing medication, trying to sell it and all that. Joker now has diplomatic immunity. Therefore, Batman can't do anything about it. And the US government decides to send Superman to ensure that Batman doesn't do anything to hurt the Joker while he is an ambassador for the United Nations. Yeah, that just sounds like too real to real life right there <laughs> it sounds like something that would just happen in the, <laughs> in the real world yeah you gotta give it us a good old diplomatic community <laughs> but yeah that was really just the major difference between the comic and the in the movie here reading the comic and just finding out that joker has diplomatic community it was just a fun little twist on such a dark story arc but yeah, that is our, those are our comic books. Uh, I don't really have like a fun name for this one because I think Death in the Family and Under the Red Hood just kind of, they're just so iconic. That I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to mess with them. Like they're just so good. I'll, I'll, I'm fine with it. I mean, I didn't really even have an RT alteration except cut those bad endings. <laughs> <laughs> Again, if you haven't watched Under the Red Hood, please do so before watching this film. And if you are watching this film, please don't watch it digitally if you can't do the interactive version. It is just so much more fun. It makes it really awesome to just see all these different stories play out. Just really just have fun with this one. I think that's the most important thing with this. That's why I think I love this most of all. Yeah, it's just so it's if you play Bandersnatch, if you play Choose Your Own Adventure book as a kid, this is just going to be right up your alley. Yep. And if you haven't, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Your childhood didn't have these, these staples. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of great stuff coming out. Keep an eye out for them. Uh, and until then, take care of yourselves and always remember that you can always choose your own adventure. Yeah, that's, that's nice. And the only adventure you can't choose is when your computer doesn't save the original <laughs> file. That's one adventure you don't want to choose. Trust us on that one. <laughs> Now that we've finished talking about our DC animated content, here are some recommended readings for you. All these comics and more can be found at your local comic shop, so remember to venture out and support your part of the source wall, and tell them Andrew and Shamar sent you. The first comic on our list is Batman A Death in the Family. This collection of comics from 1988 is the inspiration behind our film, however the film does mostly adapt our next comic, Batman Under the Red Hood. This collection contains the popular 2004 story turned film by Judd Winnick that shows the return of Jason Todd as he forces Batman to deal with what he considers to be his biggest mistake. Finally, I wanted to share Red Hood and the Outlaw comics that started in 2011. However, like Wu-Tang, yet another DC animated podcast is for the children. So definitely check out Lego Batman Family Matters. It's another adaptation of Under the Red Hood, but it's just so much fun for the whole family. And never forget that the great thing about anime productions for kids is that they're usually full of comic book Easter eggs. That's all for our list. Thank you for listening and be sure to rate, review, and follow yet another DC animated podcast. Also, interact with us on social media for news on upcoming content. Take care and we'll see you for the next issue.